So in the last couple of episodes, I discussed Wax Tracks industrial bands, and now it's time to take another detour. Instead of revisiting that halcyon year of 1990 for the millionth time, you know, that year that we agree all the best music was made, it was all downhill from there, folks. I'm going to jump way ahead to the time in my life after I became a responsible grown-up. Uh, you know, a time in my life uh, where I still listen to a ton of music, but mostly on my old second-generation iPod, the one with the click wheel that you see here. I can tell I have a bunch of old iPods. I even have an iPod shuffle somewhere. I don't really know where it got to. Uh, what are we supposed to do with these things now that we're not using them anymore? Uh, a buddy of mine just recently hung all of his old iPods on a wall in his house, kind of like art. And I think that's a, as good an idea as any. But I'm talking about a time around 2005 or so. So iTunes was a thing. BitTorrent was a thing. The music industry was just coming around to the idea that serious change was coming. Now, I'm no media pirate, obviously. I have a huge CD collection. And in fact, I still buy CDs. Uh, but you have to view Napster and all the peer-to-peer networks that followed in the light of some history. So in the early 2000s, the music industry was coming off two decades of the compact disc. Consumers were routinely spending $20 or more for a CD that cost about two cents to produce. We were getting fleeced. <laughs> so the markup was absurd, especially when you consider that fans were often repurchasing music they'd previously bought on vinyl or cassette. So there'd been a lot of turnaround over the previous couple of decades. There was always a new format to chase. And of course, this was good for musical artists. They benefited from this. So that much was good. You know, they had an incentive to continue making great music. Uh, but the fact was that consumers had been taken advantage of for a long time and were getting pretty sick of it. And I have to say that for myself, I wasn't complaining when I saw the label suffering from piracy back in the early 2000s. I thought there was an element of justice in that. There was an element of long-awaited payback. You know, these corporate suits, these tastemakers, these talentless middlemen were no longer in a position to siphon fortunes from consumers and artists. And I thought that was a good thing. And it would have been a perfect thing, except that piracy would also go on to strangle artists. Uh, there just wasn't a financial model at the time that benefited the artists anymore. Um, the fact was that music in its new form as digital files was now free. And by that, I mean it was free as in free beer, not as in freedom. It was cost-free. It had no financial value. So. As soon as an artist created a song, however long that took, however difficult it was, it simply became five megabytes of data that could be endlessly copied. And there was no way to control that once it was out the door. Technology had very simply just caught up to the industry. And it was pretty clear you know, to most people, I think, that what was happening for music would eventually happen to other industries. It would happen to other media like movies, radio, and print, unless, unless, as the Lorax said, someone came up with a compelling for-pay model, something that was easier than a BitTorrent client. And you'd think that would be easy, after all, because BitTorrent was and still is a fantastic way, a fantastic way to get malware, right? But um, in a way, this all mirrors the illegal drug trade. You know, you can get whatever you want on the black market, but it comes with a risk. For one, it's illegal. For another, you're never really sure what you're getting, whether you're getting malware or maybe you're getting pot laced with fentanyl or pills made out of cat litter. I mean, it could be anything. So at the time, you know, there was a gap there. There was an opportunity for someone to provide a safe channel that was for pay. Uh, it just had to be easier and safer than the alternative. So enter Apple and iTunes. They were the first company to try to solve this problem. And for sure, iTunes at the time was hailed as the obvious future model. 
Apple was set, you know, they were they were said to be very forward thinking. You know, this was a situation where all songs on iTunes were 99 cents. Oh, we never thought of that. What a great idea. Uh, iTunes let you have a short free preview of every song that was unheard of. Um, of course, the downside was that it was all tied to having Apple hardware, which was expensive. Um, and that's where the iPod came in. Uh, it was this relatively modest price bit of consumer electronics that was meant to make iTunes and the future of music accessible to most anyone. Anyone, that is, who could afford an iPod and who could afford some kind of computer to run iTunes and who could afford a monthly ISP bill to connect to the internet and who could afford 99 cents per song or $10 per album. So yeah, it was cheaper than buying a Macintosh, but Apple was definitely targeting the middle class, you know, those people who had a decent amount of disposable income and a class of people in the United States, at least, that would be shrinking over the coming decades. Uh, but you know, that's okay, because for everyone else, there was still your local dealer, BitTorrent. Um, so where was I in all of this? In 2005, I was still buying CDs, surprise, surprise. And to me, that was a no-brainer, and it's still a no-brainer, right? So in 2005, computers still came with CD-ROM drives, so it was pretty trivial to rip a CD. And once you did, you would own that music forever in perfect quality, and you'd have the CD as an offline archive just in case your hard drive failed someday. And I still think this is a good idea, by the way. Uh, but how was I buying CDs back then? Well, a funny thing happened to me in the early 1990s. I moved to the big city, and I discovered secondhand music stores. And I quickly learned that this was the way to go. So I'd pay just $7.99 for a used CD as opposed to $20 for a new one. And naturally, the artist wasn't getting a cut off my purchase, but then they got the cut already from whoever had bought it new. And I figured that this was no less moral than buying secondhand books or clothes or anything. In other words, it was perfectly moral. And as a student who really didn't have a disposable income, it just made sense to me, and it still does. Uh, so that's been my MO ever since. Buy physical CDs or DVDs. I buy used when I can, and I buy new when I can't, like, you know, for new releases, uh, or if it's just to provide some extra support to an artist. Uh, I'm not saying that this approach is especially valiant or anything, but it works for me. Uh, and of course, <coughs> all of this moved to streaming in the early 2010s once mobile carriers introduced broadband services. And suddenly, everything you once could own, like music or software, became available by subscription. Now, subscriptions, in my opinion, not that you ask, but they're the last resort of a company that can no longer sustain itself on an ownership model. So, for instance, Microsoft provides Office 365 as a subscription because no one has any incentive to keep upgrading it, buying it over and over, even with Microsoft trying to force obsolescence through a lack of support or a lack of backwards compatibility. I mean, Microsoft knows and you know, and I know that Word and Excel have for at least 20 years done everything that anyone would ever need them to do. And you can make the same argument for Windows. You can make the same argument with many things that companies are trying to sell us. Uh, the fact is they have to come up with a way to keep selling this crap to us, folks. And after decades of the same stuff, they run out of reasons for us to keep buying it. Sales start to crater. And what's the answer? Yes, subscriptions. You can't own it anymore. Sorry, you can only rent it. And for that seller, it becomes a guaranteed perpetual income stream. And that's why we have Spotify, Netflix, Hulu, Disney+, Plus, Peacock, blah, blah, whatever. Um, if you thought it was bad in the 90s when you had a huge cable bill every month and maybe you were cursing out Comcast or whatever your cable provider was, Maybe you thought or hoped at the time that the internet would somehow democratize that and you'd be able to stick it to the cable companies. Well, surprise, sucker. 
you're now paying a dozen cable bills and you don't own anything. So it's clear, should be clear by now that I don't play that game. I don't do the subscription thing. Uh, and it's also why I still buy CDs and DVDs and physical books directly from the artist or author when I can. Okay, so the way I think of it is spend to own, vote with your money, and that's the moral of the story. And speaking of the moral, let's get back to our original story about music. So in 2005, the secondhand music market was still pretty active in the United States. There were, at least where I live, plenty of secondhand music stores, um, CD stores, vinyl, whatever. I'd been visiting these stores regularly for about 15 years at that point, and I had amassed a collection of maybe a few hundred CDs, most of which I had ripped to my trusty iPod or whatever. Um, but it was a great and interesting feeling to wander around a used music store just browsing in the bins because you never knew what you were going to find. And you were, you were on a treasure hunt for hidden gold, <laughs> a rare import or a bootleg or something that was maybe a limited edition, something you'd never seen before. And the best part was going in blind without any preconceived idea or looking for anything in particular. I just kind of free associate through the store. I check out this and that. Maybe one time, you know, uh, a box set of jazz from Blue Note Records would catch my eye and I would pick that up. Or I'd stumble across Coil's unreleased themes from Hellraiser. Or maybe an import New Order album that had all the rare bonus tracks. Or maybe like a band called Apocalyptica that played Metallica songs on four cellos. I mean, you d there was all kinds of neat stuff to discover. You just never knew, and it was an adventure. Sometimes my interests were picked entirely due to the artwork. They say you can't judge a book by its cover. That's clearly baloney. Of course you can. Uh, when I go to my local library, I can pull any book off the fiction shelf and immediately tell which category it falls into. It's always one of the following. You got romance, supernatural romance, teen romance, teen supernatural romance, true crime, supernatural crime, or teen supernatural crime. That's the state of literature these days, folks. Uh, every now and then in the library, I'll find something that doesn't fit in those categories, and those are the books I read. Uh, popular genre fiction is not my thing. Uh, the point is that the package is absolutely a reliable guide to the contents. Uh, I mean, I talked about this in the Knights of Ebb episode two, and that's a band that knows the value of a good album cover. When you think about that total age and belief and showtime, all awesome covers. Unfortunately, they threw all that out the window for Ebbhead, which is absolutely the ugliest album cover I've ever had the misfortune to see. What can you say? You can't win them all. Anyway, imagine me now, 20 years younger, browsing my local used CD shop, and I'm drifting through the M's, and I'm probably hoping to find a ministry bootleg or some TKK or some Meat Beat Manifesto, and I spy with my little eye an interesting digipack with that telltale Helvetica font on the edge. And it says, which you can hardly read, Massive Attack Mezzanine. And maybe because of that Helvetica, which reminded me of a New Order sleeve and was very much the, the style at the time for a certain kind of band, I pull this CD out. And the first thing I notice is its very striking cover design. It's mostly a black and white close-up of a stag beetle, but if you look closely at it, you can see torn metal, almost like they took a photo of the beetle and pasted it to an airplane fuselage and then blasted it with machine gun fire. <laughs> so it was pretty interesting. Uh, and then I saw that this album unfolded into a triptych, and there were moody photos of three dudes uh, you know, presumably the band members 
But what really sealed it for me was the actual CD. I was expecting more black and white or maybe just a formal black, but no, it was bright orange uh, with just a catalog number in the middle or something. And kids, I had never heard Massive Attack at this point. I didn't know any of their songs or what they sounded like or what they were at all. I think I had heard of them possibly because at the time I vaguely associated them with rap. Now I'm not a huge rap fan. I like some rap, uh, but frankly with a design this good, who really cared what the music was like? I just wanted to own this CD. <laughs> I kind of wanted to just display it like a piece of visual art. I mean, this is amazing. So I bought this thing, uh, this copy right here, and I remember going out to my car and taking that orange disc with maybe a little bit of trepidation and slipping it into my trusty dashboard CD player. I was not prepared for what came out of the speaker, and what came out changed me somewhat, and it made me an immediate Massive Attack fan. Uh, keep in mind that this album was released in 1998, so it was already seven years old at this point. All I could think was, I've been such a fool not to discover this sooner. I mean, this is amazing. For once, I was the first in my friend group to clue into a genre, a whole new genre to listen to. And in this case, it was called trip hop otherwise known as the Bristol Sound, which is not to be confused with the Bristol Stomp, which is something else entirely, believe me. Uh, some of the other early trip-hop bands include Portishead, or Portasheed, as we called them, uh, Tricky, uh, Bjork rode that wave for a few years, and it influenced a lot of electronic artists over the years. Um, artists like Burial, who ended up remixing an entire Massive Attack album some years later, and even Nine Inch Nails have recorded some songs with Trip Hop as an influence. So, who were Massive Attack? Uh, by the time I heard them, Wikipedia was a thing, so it wasn't super hard to figure out their story. Uh, they were a bunch of folks from Bristol, England, and for those keeping track, Bristol's well south of Manchester, but also on the west coast. It's also well west of London at about the same latitude. So Bristol is where Trip Hop was born. Uh, and in the late 90s, there was a scene emerging there. And the band itself was three guys at the time of Mezzanine, the three guys pictured inside. So you had Robert Del Naja, AKA 3D, he was this street artist turned rapper. Uh, in fact, there were those who thought he was actually Banksy, since Banksy is known to be from B Bristol as well, and it's known that he and 3D are friends. Uh, but today, all signs point to them actually being, you know, of similar backgrounds, but not the same individual. And that's all I can say about that. Uh, there was also Grant Marshall, otherwise known as Daddy G and Andrew Vowles, otherwise known as, as Mushroom. And interestingly, he got his nickname because he liked to play Atari Centipede arcade game. So he is a man after my own heart. Uh, all three of these guys got their start in a Bristol sound system called the Wild Bunch, which also included Adrian Thaws, also known as Tricky. So what's a sound system? It's kind of like you know, a mobile DJ set up with like speakers and a turntable. And the idea was to make all that stuff somewhat portable so you could have spontaneous street parties and throwdowns. And this was an idea that originated in Jamaica. Uh, somehow or other, it translated into England in the 1980s. Who knows? So yeah, 3D, Daddy G, Mushroom, and Tricky split off from the Wild Bunch to form Massive Attack. And their first couple albums were recognizable as hip-hop. Uh, they had maybe somewhat jazzier and atmospheric sounds on them, and they were early trip-hop, uh, and they, they did have more of an upbeat sound. There were actual moments of positivity and levity on those records. Uh, on Mezzanine, not so much. Uh, the guest artists on Mezzanine included Horace Andy, he's a, a veteran roots reggae singer from Jamaica. He's a frequent collaborator. 
he sings on two songs here. Um, on one of them, uh, it was called Angel, and it has some relation to his 1973 tune, You Are My Angel. Uh, remember, this was recorded back in the 90s when it was pretty hip to generously sample from your heroes, even to the point of remaking or rebooting their music or even inviting them to sing on your album. <laughs> it would still be a few years yet before artists would jealously guard their IP. And, you know, you'd see Lars Ulrich of Metallica wheel a three-foot pile of Napster users into a courtroom. Uh, also on here is Elizabeth Frazier of the Cocteau Twins. She's on three songs. That alone was a real catch that made the black eyeshadow crowd really sit up and take notice here. Uh, I think it captured them a whole new demographic. Uh, also, Sarah J. Harley sings on one track, and I haven't found much info on her. Maybe I'm just ignorant, but I think she did a great job on that song. Tricky, I should say, was not on Mezzanine, but he definitely was involved in their earlier stuff and is involved with the band right now. So let's talk a little more uh, about this album and what happened after I bought it. So like I said, I bought it without knowing anything about the band and I just played it in my car. I think I essentially stopped what I was doing that day and just listened to the entire album and then I listened to it again and I had just never heard anything quite like it. It had elements of industrial, lots of dark minor key brooding and ambiance. It had beats, but the beats were not fast. There was nothing too fast. They were slow and really groovy. It was all swingy and swampy with lots of syncopation, and the rhythms were all slightly off. It had strange samples, yet the production was top-notch. Uh, you know, it's it's just a, it was such a weird thing. The production was great, but there was also this like lo-fi quality to it all. It was almost like they hired Brian Eno to piece together this album from a bunch of really lo-fi 8-bit samples, uh, if that makes any sense. I mean, it was almost like a, you know, it felt like a Ferrari someone had gone off-roading in. <laughs> uh, I mean, there were plenty of vinyl clicks and pops all through it, even though this was a CD, very high quality. But that's clearly what they wanted. It was almost as if they overlaid the entire album with a constant loop of vinyl runoff groove pops and clicks. Uh, and the rap, uh, I guess the vocals were rapped somewhat, I suppose, but it didn't fit squarely into the rap category in my mind. The vocals were somewhere between hip hop and Sprecke song. Uh, but yeah, let's, let's look through the booklet here. It comes with a pretty good booklet. See, there's uh, more artwork. There's that busted up metal. There's some song credits. There aren't any lyrics in here. There's some more artwork, some thank yous. And, you know, it's appropriately mysterious, I'll say. Um, and there's definitely a focus on the artwork there. So let's talk about the songs. The lead-off track is called Angel, and like I said, it's, it's sort of a take on that earlier Horace Andy tune. Um, this was my first impression of the record and of the band. The first thing you hear is this sub-bass that comes in with a very minimalistic drum machine. And then this brooding kind of bass line starts. And I already loved where this was going. It had only been playing about 20 seconds. Uh, and then Horace Andy starts to sing. And if you're not familiar with him, he has this very peculiar vocal delivery. He sort of has like a kill switch on his voice box <laughs> that messes with his, his sustain a little bit. But um, it works really, really well for these songs. Um, this song is a builder. It never really changes. But at one point, the drums and the guitar kick in, and you're like, yes! It's a really intense song uh, where the basic thing that's going on is that it's building and releasing tension. 
with a very simple arrangement. It just builds and releases tension amazingly well. And the way they do that makes it sound like something that's right off of a film soundtrack. It makes it seem like you're watching something terrible unfold, like a car crash or a train wreck in slow motion, and then the whole thing resolves. It's just a very powerful song, and it's just a perfect intro for this album. That goes into Rising Sun. Uh, this has just an amazing bass line over your, your shuffly, staggered beats with 3D and Daddy G doing their low-key kind of rap delivery. Um, I don't know why they called it Rising Sun when the, t- the chorus vocal is just dream on. <laughs> I don't know. I'm sure it makes some kind of sense. That goes. It's just a great tune, a fantastic tune. And that goes into Teardrop. This is maybe their biggest hit. Uh, It's a really simple song in terms of the arrangement and the instrumentation. Uh, Again, there's that characteristic, slow, swaggery, trip-hop beat. There's a guitar that's playing a steady arpeggio of three or four notes. There's a very simple piano part that's the same three chords over and over. And these things kind of interlock and repeat. And uh, really all the intensity and complexity is coming from the vocal, which happens to be by Elizabeth Frazier. And as you know, her voice is really beautiful, but anyone familiar with her work knows she has just a very unique delivery. Um, It's kind of hard to make out her words, but the emotion comes right through. Um, It's a really dynamic track. Again, it builds up and releases. Most of the songs on this album do that masterfully. Anyway, that's a favorite track. Um, then we go into track four, Inertia Creeps. If this album had a dance hit, it would be that tune. It's got a more aggressive rhythm. It's a little faster. It's almost industrial. It's another favorite on this album for sure. And I understand that the rhythm and the instrumental samples here came from a a recording that 3D surreptitiously made of Turkish music when he was in an Istanbul nightclub. (laughs) So that kind of gives this song its own unique exotic flavor uh, and I, I really love it what a great tune it might be my second favorite tune on the album that goes into exchange I don't know I, I tend to dismiss this song a little bit it's an intermission of sorts it's kind of like a light jazz it's a palate cleanser in between courses and if you look closely enough you can almost see the dancing popsicles listeners of a certain age will get that reference uh that goes into dissolved girl uh this track kicks off what i think of as side two i'm not sure if it really was side two i don't have the vinyl um but before we get into it i think you have to agree that the first four songs after you listen to them are pretty much flawless and in fact are pretty (laughs) jaw-dropping by now halfway pardon me halfway into this record you're aware that you're dealing with a masterpiece. Um, Now, Dissolve Girl is a strong song, but I would argue that it's maybe not as strong as the first four. It's not that it's bad, but it never really hits the emotional peaks like the others. Um, It's maybe a bit less dynamic with a bit less tension going on, and maybe that's by design. Maybe the second half of this album is the come down. Not entirely sure. Um, Anyway, Sarah J. Hawley's vocals are great and memorable. Really good, solid track. That goes into Man Next Door. Okay, I take back everything I said about Side 2 a minute ago because this song is as strong as anything on Side 1. This is a cover of a John Holt song that was first recorded by the Paragons in 1968. And you can check out that version online. Massive Attack pretty much did a very straight cover here. They really just slowed down the original by 25%. And you can actually listen to the original version on YouTube and use the internal controls to slow down the playback to 75% and hear the result for yourself. It sounds very much like this version here. It's very eerie. Um, They also threw in on this version the trusty drum samples from Led Zeppelin's When the Levee Breaks. And yes, kids, the same drums that powered the Beastie Boys, Rhymin' and Stealin' and Depeche Mode's Never Let Me Down Again uh, are on this track. Are any of these bands paying royalties to John Bonham's estate? Probably not. 
Uh, do I want to go to YouTube right now and listen to the 30 minute loop of him playing that drum break over and over? Absolutely. I absolutely do. I'm going to do it right after I'm done here. And you should too. It's a good way to clear your head. Uh, anyway, this song tells a fun story of a problem neighbor. And in my mind, it's sort of a residential situational drama, kind of like Spying Glass was from the Protection album, except in Spying Glass, the neighbor is Jimmy Stewart in Rear Window, and in Man Next Door, it's Frank Booth from Blue Velvet. <laughs> All right, so then we have Black Milk. Um, this song's very chill, definitely a come down song, has a really nice bass line and piano arpeggios. Again, pretty simple stuff, but with Liz Frazier's vocals. And on any other album, this would be a standout masterpiece, but here it's almost filler, but Really good track, nonetheless. That goes into Mezzanine. Uh, this is the obligatory song I don't much care for. It's atonal. It doesn't groove a whole lot. It doesn't really go anywhere. Uh, it kind of becomes a drum machine freakout uh, with 3D's vocals thrown in. Uh, he keeps saying in the, in the chorus, all these half floors which I guess is a reference to actual mezzanines. So what is a mezzanine anyway? Uh, it's an architectural feature in some buildings. It's kind of a partial floor in between your full floors, usually set up in such a way that you can see down to the floor below. It's kind of like a loft. Um, if you're in an elevator and you see a button that's marked M, that's likely, likely for the mezzanine. So go ahead and press it. Check it out. Um, the word itself comes from the Italian word mezzanino, which is the diminutive of mezzano for middle. Uh, sometimes a mezzanine has a lower ceiling than the other floors. And for more on that, I recommend you see the movie Being John Malkovich. So what is the analogy being made here between architectural mezzanines and this album? I have no idea. Um, the lyrics to this tune are pretty abstract. It is a cool sounding word though, and architecturally, mezzanines can be interesting. So, what can I say? Finally, that goes into uh, group four. This is the last song featuring Liz Frazier. This one is kind of a duet between her and 3D. Again, this is a decent song, solid song, has a groovy bass line and drums. Uh, again, like Black Milk, it'd be a standout on any other album. Here, it's just more of the same, and for me, it just isn't quite as memorable as the songs on side A. Uh, it does, though, get pretty intense in the second half. It introduces some noisy rock guitar. It does this interesting thing at the end where it just slows down a wee bit before ending in a huge reverb echo, which is pretty cool. The album ends with the song Exchange in parentheses. This is essentially the same track as the earlier exchange, except it has vocals from Horace Andy. And it's sort of an after-dinner mint to kind of round the whole album out and send you out into that cold night on your merry way. So they did make a bunch of videos for these songs. Um, talk about them real quick, because I feel like they're part of this overall package. They made a video for Angel. It's probably one of my favorite music videos ever, probably in the top three, and I don't want to spoil it for you if you haven't seen it, but if you haven't, I highly recommend you check it out. It's five minutes of your life well spent, and all I can say is I sometimes have dreams like that, uh, so what starts out as a nightmare turns into me somehow turning the tables, and sometimes that happens through lucid dreaming, I realize I'm dreaming and then I take control of the situation. Sometimes that involves me having some sort of weird power or fighting back. Uh, I guess I'm a lot more aggressive in my dreams than real life. <laughs> but I, it's weird, but these are maybe bad dreams in some way, but I find inspiration in them because, let's face it, there are terrible things in the world and sometimes they affect us. I mean, they can affect us in a personal way or maybe even an impersonal way, but it's important to remember that we each have our own power inside us too, and it is possible for us to use that power, 
in a positive way. I mean, you for one thing, you can defend yourself, right? Or you can find the strength in yourself to fight back and overcome some trouble. And it kind of comes down to the mindset of being a hard target, you know, not just running from your problems, but facing them head on and taking them on. And who knows, maybe in the end you can make them turn tail. And I find that inspiring. And it would look really good on a bumper sticker too, I think. I can see it now. Be a pain in the ass to your problems. <laughs> or make your fears afraid of you. So that's the video to Angel. Check it out and you'll understand what I'm talking about. Uh, they did a video for Rising Sun. And all of these videos are kind of filmed, of course, in slow motion. Very stylized with very dramatic lighting. And all of the band members kind of looking constipated. Uh, this one is just the band more or less performing the song in a house that's being broken into. So a dude comes through the front door with a chainsaw. But, you know, Daddy G is just calmly making a sandwich while that happens. Um, 3D sort of laughs at the end. So who knows? Maybe this was their attempt at humor. Pretty funny video, though. They did a video, of course, for Teardrop, the big hit. This is actually a pretty trippy video of an animated fetus that sings the song. And it's not really as creepy as it sounds, but I have to wonder what Liz Frazier thought of a fetus singing her words. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe it was her idea. Uh, then there's Inertia Creeps. And this one is kind of a police procedural with 3D as the forensics cop and Daddy G and Mushroom doing something we can't quite see to a woman in a chair. I don't know what to make of it. It's pretty strange, but with a song that badass, I mean, the video hardly matters. <laughs> so why do I love this album? Um, you know, to me, the sound sort of extended from what I most loved about Depeche Mode, okay? And that was the sound that Alan Wilder and Flood were taking the band toward in the early to mid-90s. So with uh, Violator and Songs of Faith and Devotion, I think Alan's solo project, Recoil, had quite a lot in common with the trip-hop sound and even some of his, uh, yeah, you know, very the various Recoil albums, uh, especially the later ones. Um, it this This genre... I think also stem from the kind of wild genre mixing that was going on in the late 80s and early 90s. So I'm thinking of bands like Tackhead, so guys like Adrian Sherwood and Keith LeBlanc, who are part of the whole sound system scene in the 80s, and they also evolved from that, um, much like Massive Attack evolved out of the Wild Bunch sound system. So Adrian Sherwood would famously bring the big sound system beats and rhythms into industrial rock, like Ministry and Nine Inch Nails. Uh, you know, he worked with uh, both Al Jorgensen and Trent Reznor on their early releases. Uh, trip hop evolved from some of those same influences, maybe even incorporating some of that earlier industrial rock, but also, you know, adding some jazz and atmospherics and some low fidelity sort of sounds to it. Um, trip hop wasn't so much about aggression as it was about evoking a style and a mood. And that mood is often described with negative type words like dark and sinister and paranoid. But maybe that's the case. But I think in general, they were going for a more, a more subtle form of power than, say, industrial rock. And as I've said before, a song like Angel is very powerful in its own way. But it's not just beating you over the head with it like Head Like a Hole does. <laughs> and I find, again, that even a dark or a sinister song can ultimately be uplifting. It's obviously, you know, not just leaving a listener in a paranoid ball under the table or only real weirdos would ever listen to this stuff. So to me, the theme of this album is, you know, a positive one. It's face your fears, confront them, and only then can you be free. So what did the band do after Mezzanine? So recording this album was a really tortured affair by all accounts. The band were not getting along. Producer Neil Davidge would 
work around the clock with first one member and then another, never having two of them in the, s in the room at the same time. And he said it was pretty common to spend one session erasing or changing the work that he accomplished in the previous session. And the root issue seemed to be that 3D was taking control of the sound and was steering it away from the hip hop of the first two albums into more of a post-punk kind of direction. And he was inspired by bands like The Cure and Susie and the Banshees. And Mushroom in particular was not on board with this. And soon after the album came out, he quit the band. And I have no idea what he did after being in Massive Attack, but I sort of hope that he somehow found an old centipede cabinet and set about getting the world record. But I have no idea. Uh, but not long after Mezzanine, they would release a box set of singles. And it included remixes and B-sides uh, from their first three albums, Blue Lines, Protection, and Mezzanine. Three of these discs in here have tracks from Mezzanine. So for instance, here's a the single for Angel. And the disc looks kind of like that, very plain. Um, so yeah, each disc has some artwork on it by 3D. Remember, he's also a visual artist, so there's some pretty cool art on here. A lot of spray paint, a lot of pen and ink, things like that. Um, it also comes in this really cool heat sensitive box. So as you hold on to it, the black turns to white. And if you hold on to it long enough, you can see some details on there that are hidden at first glance because there are strings of numbers, there are lines, there are shapes. Who knows, maybe it's the key to the whole thing, folks. If I just put this whole thing into the microwave, there we go, some nice weird number station numbers for you. Pretty cool packaging. Um, but yeah, 3D put this artwork together. Remember, he's also a visual artist. There's a big poster in here, too, that unfolds to show all the credits and the details. It's kind of unwieldy. I think I've unfolded it once or twice. But yeah, singles, 90, 98. Pretty cool package. Uh, Massive Attack would go on to record just two more studio albums after Mezzanine. There would be 100th Window, which was more or less a 3D solo affair uh, since Mushroom had quit at that time and Daddy G was off, I don't know, rearranging his sock drawer or doing something else. Uh, then there was Heligoland uh, in, I think it was around 2010 or so. So the albums are getting farther and farther apart as usual. And that album saw the return of Daddy G. Uh, so they toured pretty regularly in the 2010s and were reportedly putting together another album. Uh, but so far, at least, it hasn't appeared. Uh, Tricky rejoined 3D and Daddy G not terribly long ago. I think that was around 2016 or so. And when they were out on tour, they even brought Liz Frazier out with them to sing her tunes from Mezzanine, which was no easy feat since she's been pretty elusive in these past few decades, so it was great to see her out with them. Uh, my understanding is their live show is pretty great from what I've seen on YouTube. Unfortunately, I've never seen them live, but that would be really awesome to do. Um, when you see the live show, they're essentially in the form of a bunch of vocalists playing with a really great backing band. Um, and there's always a lot of people on stage. Everyone's busy. There's good energy. It's just great to see people actually playing the music. Uh, they haven't toured since COVID, but they were out as recently as 2020, and hopefully they'll come around again. Time will tell. So anyway, there you have it, kids. Trip Hop Pioneers, Massive Attack, and what might be their mightiest album, Mezzanine. If you enjoyed this, stick around. I have plenty more 80s and 90s albums to consider. This show, Stronger Than Reason, is available on YouTube and as a podcast wherever you do that podcast thing. And if you like what you heard, please like and subscribe. And reminder, I'm just one weird old dude with an opinion. Consider leaving your opinion as a comment here. And if you made it this far, thanks for listening. Until next time. Stay strong.